vamos a tener una conferencia magistral, estamos ahora entrando en nuestro eje de ciudades sostenibles y esta eh, transversalidad del cambio climático en el tema de eh, las ciudades y del urbanismo. Entonces, eh, esta conferencia magistral va a ser en inglés, ustedes en Zoom pueden escoger qué idioma eh, quieren escuchar, por abajo, eh, abajo en, en la parte de abajo se dice idioma, eh, en el chat van a estar ayudando a cualquier persona que tenga eh, preguntas y quiero dar la bienvenida a Henk Ovink. Él es eh, enviado especial para asuntos internacionales del agua, Sherpa de la ONU sobre el agua y embajador del agua de los Países Bajos. Y él va a dar la conferencia magistral Bienvenida el agua, protección climática para la resiliencia. Henk, como embajador, es responsable de promover la concientización sobre el agua en todo el mundo, centrándose en la creación de coaliciones entre gobiernos, organizaciones multilaterales, el sector privado y ONGs para abordar las necesidades urgentes del agua en el mundo. Es director de Rebuild by Design y fue asesor principal en la reconstrucción del huracán Sandy en Estados Unidos. Fue director general interino de la planificación espacial y asuntos hídricos y director de planificación espacial nacional de los Países Bajos. Es miembro del Consejo Asesor Internacional de la Ciudad de Rotterdam y fue curador de la Quinta Bienal Internacional de Arquitectura de Rotterdam 2012. Él inició el programa de investigación Design and Politics, la Cátedra de conexión en la TUDELF y es editor en jefe de las publicaciones Design and Politics. Estamos muy contentos de que Henk eh, nos pudo eh, dar esta charla. Bienvenido, Henk. Thank you, Zara. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, as a special envoy for water, I of course start with water. Uh, and this is an image of planet Earth. Uh, it's called the Blue Marble. It was taken in 1972 by Apollo 17, and it's actually the first snapshot of our, of our planet. And it shows, of course, the world in its full capacity, but also vulnerability. And at the same time, there's a lot of water. 71% of the world's surface is water. So that feel, you know, it feels like there's a massive amount. But what I do now is I take this big vacuum cleaner and I take all the water the planet holds off. And what do we have? Another sphere, another round form. Uh, there are not all of a sudden holes in it. It doesn't become a Swiss cheese. And if I put all the water I just took off also in the sphere, it does not even have the size of the United States. So while it, you have the feeling that there is a lot of water, actually water is very scarce. And then if you look at that, that is the massive amount of water, salt water and so forth. The amount of fresh water is even smaller. The three spheres and the smallest one is the amount of water. 0.3, 0.4%, the world's uh, water is the water we can use as humans for our consumption, but also for food production. And we've seen it over the past one and a half year, how water being such a driver for Uh, uh, economic prosperity, uh, equity and equality also is the first line of defense in the context of a pandemic. Wash your hands. Eh? We all said it. Uh, but uh, for over two billion people around the world uh, that do not have access to safe drinking water, over three billion, no access to hygiene facilities and over four, no uh, access to safe sanitation facilities that water barrier, that buffer, that first line of defense is even uh, without reach. Now, it's water and health, uh, but water cuts across all challenges we find around the world, being it climate, gender, GDP, urbanization, security, and so forth, and so forth. And if you add all these challenges up, you look at the world a little different. And then all of a sudden, vulnerability uh, is Uh, most progressed uh, in uh, uh, parts of Africa uh, and Asia. COVID, of course, uh, our water are directly linked, uh, linked through biodiversity and our biodiversity and the quality or the degradation is again linked to the availability, uh, the quality uh, of that same water. And now we know how the response to climate change and the response to this coronavirus 
can be linked to climate and water. Again, uh, two of the same kind. And we see it through the disasters, looking back 2018 with floods, droughts and wildfires, 2019, 2020, and also this year uh, in my home country and in Germany and Belgium, massive floods with hundreds of deaths. But at the same time, we saw wildfires uh, uh, in California, floods in China, um, uh, in Latin America, uh, and so forth, and so forth. 80% uh, of all climate disasters are water related. With too much and too little water. Uh, with floods, we have an immediate impact, costing billions of dollars and many amounts of uh, lives. With droughts, there's even um, an ongoing inf effect on the GDP loss. So this is a massive challenge. Water and climate are linked where we have to find solutions for. And this will not be done by past practices. This is not the world where we can say, hey, Houston, we have a problem. Let's bring in white male 50 plus and find a engineering solution. And this, this calls for an inclusive, holistic and sustainable approach where everybody is involved. Uh, and everybody means following Secretary General Guterres uh, comments on the, on the pandemic, who said, which I really like, eh, uh, uh, really true to my, my conviction and my call to action. He said, this is a time for science and solidarity. Science, we need to understand, believe in the facts, dare to believe in research, in policy, uh, in evidence, uh, in val validation and evaluation. And solidarity, uh, we have to do it together. This is about inclusivity, reaching out to everyone, leaving no one behind. Uh, but it is also about institutional capacity, about governance and, and governments that can be trusted and are, and are accountable. So with understanding comes research. And we have this amazing panel, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just released their new, latest AR6 report on climate change, the physical science basis, as you see, but I want to, uh, uh, and over the last years, they presented the global warming 1.5 and the ocean and cryosphere report, but I wanted to call your attention to the middle one, which is called Climate Change and Land, a report from 2019. And it shows that over 99% of all our investments that we're making in our cities, our economies, in infrastructure is increasing climate change. And the way how we develop our cities, our economies, our infrastructure is increasing our vulnerability. So two sides of the same coin is that you, that you can see is that the majority of what we do is making the future more impossible. In the minority, in the 1%, lies the opportunity to solve this crisis. Scaling up that 1% to 2, 4, 16 and more will help us mainstream uh, better policies and practices, practices across the world. And we better because we are not heading in the right direction. As you know, with more floods and droughts and more people on the run. And that is manifested specifically in cities. Cities are the hotspots where climate change hits hardest. It is a matter of costs where it adds up to a trillion dollar a year with global flood damage in those cities. And uh, research shown is that the top 10 places are urbanized places around the world, of course, Asia, of course, the United States, but also my home country, the Netherlands. It's again, a matter of cost, but also of social and societal vulnerability because there are unequal flood risks within cities. Poor people live in poor places. Vulnerable communities are hit hardest and have the hardest time to get back on their feet. So it's a financial economic question. There's a social and societal question. It is a matter of health, yeah. poor water quality increased by climate change as a devastating effect, effect um, uh, mostly uh, on the most vulnerable, uh, as well as the very young. And then it cuts across our biodiversity. Uh, we just come from Kunmin, the biodiversity co uh, 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 conference, 
showcasing again that our biodiversity decline has to be reversed to be able to build up resiliency and sustainability uh, in our cities and society. So we're not on track. We're heading for the wrong direction. There is a disconnect between the past and the future. And that is because there is a business case for stupid infrastructure, my words, eh? making us more vulnerable with every dollar spent. That is the infrastructure that comes from the past, that are the practices and policies that are single focused, that try to solve one solution in this myriad of challenges. And because of that, continue to be reactive uh, and failing in the context of the challenge. But there's no need. There is hope. We have not for nothing agreed about uh, as a world on 17 sustainable development goals. Not one, but 17. Not as uh, one, but as a holistic agenda, a comprehensive agenda to deal with the challenges uh, the world faces. And in that agreement uh, in 2015, uh, we agreed to move on climate change. The Paris Agreement limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. We know business as usual is no longer not enough. It is lethal. And we face that lethal impact of climate change every day. So we have to reverse course. And it is possible. This non-responsive way is failing. Even the way how we are becoming reactive. Every day there is a crisis, uh, a disaster, climate or health driven. But that reactive approach from crisis to crisis leads to band-aid approaches with temporary solutions. We have to become radically inclusive, really change everything we do and move to a proactive, uh, uh, comprehensive, uh, future-oriented approach. And water can help. Water is the springboard. Investing in water has a trickle-down effect across all SDGs, and I will show you. But it starts with focusing on people, the enabling environment. This is where we make projects work. It's the capacity to collaborate, the capacity to build an enabling environment, the capacity also to innovate. Investing in people with the millions we have will leverage the opportunities to invest in the billions of projects. And the economists all agree. Hmm? If you maximize opportunity, eh, invest in people and process, the impact and performance of those opportunities increase. And for that, we need the capacity of water that is transformative. As said, investing in water has a trickle-down effect across all SDGs. But that comes with an understanding of that complex relationship it comes with valuing water holistically, inclusively, uh, across all its values, not only economic, but also social, cultural, environmental, and economic, and manage water. Manage water on every scale. Scale of your neighborhood, your community, your city, the scale of the systems uh, of our watershed. And for that, we have to look at the holistic, inclusive and sustainable approach. An approach that starts with the long term, that ties together uh, all those challenges in a comprehensive way, connected with short term, innovative, catalytic solutions that are developed in an inclusive, collaborative approach where you build capacity by developing the solutions. And at the same time, in the context where you have accountability and transparency, but also mechanisms to validate and evaluate. With that, with that long-term, short-term, in an inclusive and accountable way, you build up capacity. You move from an innovation to a project, from a project to a program, and for a program to a pipeline. You build capacity among professionals, in communities, individual, as well as institutional. With that approach, we can change the world. And design helps. Eh? We need inspiration to move away from vested interest and 99% of stupid infrastructure investment towards scaling up that 1%. Design is solution-oriented. Eh? It's innovative, catalytic, and pragmatic. And we need those innovative, catalytic, and pragmatic solutions. 
The design also has the capacity to connect across scales, times, and interests. And we have to step out of our silos and make those connections eh, across every interest in society, but also across all those sustainable development problems. But design is a third layer, and that is the layer to be aspirational and inspirational. Shying away from past practices, facing that future head on, really looking that future in the, in the eye, demands a future-oriented approach. Now, that's possible, but that means, again, investing in the process. Uh, and, and as we say in literature, in soft spaces, uh, where you can, are able to build trust and capacity. When I worked for President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Task Force, we developed Re Rebuild by Design, creating a safe space across communities to really look at it as a sidestep out of the institutional lock-in and invest with each other in, uh, uh, in an enormous amount of capacity. I learned this also through water partnerships in the Netherlands. The Netherlands being a country very much below sea level for a third and 60% flood prone. It was the capacity, governmental, institutional for that matter, but also informal where communities got together, where we developed solutions that now deal with uh, coastal safety, uh, urban quality, and uh, uh, of course, riverine uh, capacity uh, in, in our cities. We have a program institutionalized uh, how to deal with current floods as well as with uh, future challenges. And we bring that capacity in our partnerships uh, as best as we can across the world. Working in our own kingdom, in the Caribbean, post-disaster, but of course working around the world in partnerships, really focusing on water-led urban and non-urban, uh, sustainable, resilient climate solution. Solutions that help millions of people around the world to get a better life through financing water, coalitions amongst partners, and panels with the highest level of capacity. It's important. Uh, it's also good to understand that climate is a main threat in that. And that means climate mitigation, which is the best adaptation strategy, limiting global warming to 1.5 degree, but also with that 1.5 degree, we have to ensure that our communities, our societies, and our systems become far more resilient. For that, we hosted the first climate adaptation summit last January, where a lot of projects, innovations, and commitments came forward that we now bring to the climate conference in Glasgow and beyond. And at the same time, Netherlands committed its leadership to the second ever, first since 1970, United Nations 2023 Water Conference. A conference where we want to bring the world together in New York to work on water. And those are coalitions, of course, of governments, uh, of course, of private sector, NGOs and academia. But it's also the coalitions that face every day the challenges uh, water and water security, and the diversion or the gap uh, between interests uh, that water security brings. The community near Thailand and Myanmar, uh, Aboriginal water projects uh, in Australia, projects in New York, or the program I helped develop uh, in uh, Asia, uh, Water as Leverage. Working for President Obama, I developed Rebuild by Design. Uh, using that uh, um, storm, using Sandy, the hurricane uh, that hit New York uh, as an opportunity. Of course, lives were lost, infrastructure was destroyed, but there was an opportunity to leapfrog into the future. It was President Obama himself that says, don't ignore the facts, don't deny the facts, even when you uh, ignore them. Uh, and under his leadership, I helped develop Rebuild by Design, a competition that drove innovative capacity across all communities, uh, government agencies, private sector, and NGO, where we developed uh, 40 plus solutions, implementing now 10 of them. Solutions that connected urban, 
and natural resources to more resilient communities uh, in New Jersey, uh, uh, on Long Island, in Manha Manhattan, Hoboken, uh, Hunts Point, and Staten Island. We selected six proposals, allocated a billion dollars, and implementing now many of them. We scaled the initiative up across the US with the National Disaster Resiliency Competition uh, and brought that competition uh, also to Africa and Southeast Asia, scaled it to the Bay Area in San Francisco, and then I brought part of that concept to an is initiative called Water as Leverage for Resilient Cities Asia. Doing a deep dive into the challenges that come with climate change and urbanization in Asia, I again developed this safe space to bring together communities, uh, institutions from across the world that were able to fi finance innovative solutions and design teams to work with those communities uh, and scale up best practices. Six teams working in three cities, and I will highlight one that is in the city of Chennai, on the east coast of India, where the Thousand Tanks team that was led by architecture firm Ooze developed an assessment of water security in the city, saying that every year water is lost. The city is urbanized, hard surface, aquifer is depleted and becoming polluted and more saline. And with that, there is a negative in the context of the water balance. But we can reclaim that balance. We can redo uh, by working on nature-based solutions on the smaller scale, reinventing the past, historic tanks, uh, rest restoring them, building new tanks, focusing on forests, renaturalized rivers and canals, building bioswales and constructed wetlands, and combine solid and liquid waste recycling and adapt the building that exist as well as young, new ones. Nature-based solutions that work on flood prevention, drought prevention, sanitation, and an improved urban environment. And they tick all of a sudden all these boxes of the sustainable development goal. Economic, equality, cultural heritage, sustainability, uh, urban environment, and so forth. We start with a small project on the scale of a school and scale that across Chennai and across Tamil Nadu uh, and the whole uh, uh, India uh, peninsula, you could say. Water as leverage tries to be transformative to make cities around the world uh, more resilient. We got credit for our approach and we're scaling it up now across the Ganges the Vietnamese coast, even in Europe uh, and parts of Latin America. We need those solutions. Uh, we have no time to waste. It is not enough to only focus on the 1%. We have to step up, scale up and replicate our actions. It's not easy. There's no silver bullet. Every place on this planet is a little different. Uh, it is about water security and having not enough water water safety and the right amount uh, of it in the best quality and preventing floods and droughts. We must step up our efforts, Secretary General Guterres said, and I couldn't agree more. We must change course now. For us, current generations, but of course, more importantly, uh, for future generations. Generations that believe in a future where it's worthwhile investing in people and places right now doing it differently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hank, for sharing with us all of those different experiences that you've had that help us to understand how these issues are really interconnected. You know, we've been doing a lot of work here in Mexico on this issue, and it's a complex issue, but with many technical solutions, but, but perhaps a lack of political continuity in the solutions. Um, do you have, what would be your um, words of advice to us in, in these contexts that are quite complex um, on how we can, how we can shift that, um, whether it's on the political side or whether on the technical side? Mexico City, for example, we have 
flooding every year around the same time in the same areas, um, and yet we don't see a change in, in how, we, how we deal with that as an issue. So what would be some of your, um, and maybe Asia, it's easier to create um, kind of parallels between Asia and Latin America, but speak to us a little bit about how we could apply some of this to our context. Well, it's interesting. Um, a couple of years ago, I was involved in an uh, assessment of Mexico City's uh, water balance. It's a little bit comparable to Chennai, although Mexico City is not a coastal city. Uh, uh, and Chennai is, a, is perhaps half of this. It's 12, 12 million people, so it's smaller scale. But there is a disbalance uh, in Mexico City too. There's, of course, an amazing history on water. Mexico City was the water city of the world. Uh, if you look at images from the way before the Spanish came, uh, before these stupid Europeans came uh, across the ocean, uh, Mexico City was this beautiful water-rich city. Uh, and it was this relationship with water in, from a historical perspective, was destroyed, of course, by economic progress and growth, eh? uh, politics and power in the way of a, a balance. And that is, that is not Mexico City's fault. That is, was, is and was happening all over the world. So it's only an example of the disconnect uh, between that rapid growth and a normal relationship with the environment. But with Deltares and the Urbanisten and NGOs from Mexico City, we developed an assessment. And if you look at the water balance Mexico City has, of course you have to worry, but there's also uh, an opportunity to bring a solution, to really look carefully and assess at that water balance and make sure that you capture every drop that falls. And of course, the time frame in which water falls in Mexico City is limited, but the amount of water is only exceeding. So you have these, and this is the same in a city like Chennai, extremes become more extreme. So you have on, um, on the scale of a year, probably enough water that you can hold, bring back to the aquifer and make sure that you help recharge that aquifer. It is also about reusing water. Don't throw it away. Water in all aspects, being it used, being it polluted, still is a resource. So clean it, reuse it, clean it again, reuse it. And there's a question of the reduction of use. Eh? Many sectors in our society can reduce water usage. Last, non-revenue water. Very technical term, but it is about failing infrastructure. Normally, there is, in our cities around the world, over 50% of water that's being lost because infrastructure through which water is flowing is failing. Yeah. If you remember Cape Town and this, this almost total dry uh, event uh, where Cape Town was running out of water, Cape Town had over 50% non-revenue water. Fixing the pipes is the first line of defense in the context of water and climate related challenges. Now, if you look at all these different aspects, bring back water as a cultural aspect in the city of Mexico, green your environment, uh, open up your parks, make sure that you clean the water, recharge the aquifer, then Mexico City being this amazing place can be again a water sensitive uh, city too so there definitely is hope for mexico city uh, but it really demands a holistic comprehensive and inclusive sustainable way of valuing water and bringing that value and capacity mainstreaming it in policies but also in projects and project practices with industry with individuals with your communities to ensure that Water is at the heart of everything you do, and that helps also to combat climate change impacts. It also mitigates heat island effects, mitigates uh, uh, carbon, your carbon footprint, and so forth. So it has, investing in that water capacity, has a rippling effect 
across Mexico City society. Yeah, just as, as you were saying that about non-revenue water, I was writing the word infrastructure um, yeah. because of the importance, know that that's some of the difficulty that we have. And, and you know, sometimes people think that it's not enough to do uh, s small, in quotations, projects such as capturing rainwater, you know, on an individual level. Um, but you're saying that this does, you know, it do it all adds up. And so I think that that's, so how many that's the message we need now? to take. And also... Yeah. I mean, this, this push that we've had in the city in years past of opening up the rivers and making them community spaces rather right. than having them in tubes as we've yeah. done. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think every, every drop counts, every drop you save counts, uh, every initiative counts with the millions of people that live in Mexico City. If every household uh, and every industry, every business, takes water serious, then you have a massive water revolution. Yeah? Of course, if it's only one citizen, nothing changes. But if you hold hands together, and this is backed by policy, backed by politics, but also backed by finance, then investing in water is the catalytic driver for change. Yeah? But it means you really have to as I said, value water, take water at, your, at the heart uh, of the matter and really embrace the opportunity of using water as a springboard for uh, security, safety and sustainability of your city. And then Mexico City. And what could be more beautiful uh, than the city that, you know, that was more beautiful than Venice? Eh? That was, you know, we now say Venice is this water capital. No, Mexico City. Latin America's water capital. Uh, it would, wouldn't it be amazing that it sets an example for these mega cities around the world by rethinking how to deal with water again? That is, uh, I think, of massive, uh, a, a massive opportunity. And remember, many people around the world are willing to collaborate. If I look at the, um, uh, the movement around sustainable development and climate action partnerships and collaborations, public and private, academic, NGOs and across, uh, there's a real urge and need to work together and a real appetite to do so. So I think it is of, uh, uh, there is a massive opportunity uh, to, do, to do better together. Well, we're in that message inspirational message that we really need a water revolution and that we can yes. hold hands to make it happen uh, with political will. Um, and so that's going to be, that's the, that's the challenge that we're launching to, to our government of working together. How do we work together to have that water, water revolution. revolution? Very good. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank Jane. you. Good luck Thank with you. the conference. Thank, Thank you. you. Pues yo me llevo de esa conferencia eh, el agua como una herramienta de revolución en nuestras ciudades y también como una pieza cultural muy importante en nuestra ciudad para crear soluciones y acciones concretas que garanticen nuestra seguridad hídrica. Eh...